Green. This session is being recorded. Hello, and welcome to the American Psychological Association series on careers in applied psychology. I'm Dr. Betsy Schoenfeld, a university distinguished professor emerita at Western Kentucky University. I'm representing the APA Office of Applied Psychology, and I will be hosting this panel. Today, we have a very interesting and informative panel on careers in law and psychology. We have six panelists representing different career paths in law and psychology. First, we have Dr. Margaret Bull Cavera, a professor at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice at the City University of New York. She will provide an overview of the field of law and psychology. Next, Dr. Jamor Maddox, is, who is a board certified forensic psychologist and managing director of Lamb and Maddox LLC, will describe his role in forensic evaluation of harm, risk, and abilities in family, civil, sentencing, and police cases. Dr. Natalie Anumba, who's assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, will share with us her role as a faculty member and as a clinical forensic psychologist in a public psychiatric hospital. Dr. Jason Cantone is a senior research attorney and associate at the Federal Judicial Center. He will describe his career in judicial processes, legal decision-making, and judicial education. Dr. April Alexander is an associate professor at the University of Denver. She will describe her role as a clinical forensic psychologist working in juvenile justice. Dr. Jason Lawrence, a staff psychologist and a certified forensic examiner with the State of Missouri Department of Mental Health, will share with us his role as a forensic examiner in the Center for Behavioral Medicine. Dr. Dennis Stoley is the immediate past president and senior consultant with Scene Vision LLC and a capital partner with Barnes Thornburg LLP. He is the new APA Senior Director of Applied Psychology and will be describing his career in trial strategy and jury consulting in high stakes litigation. Margaret will start the panel with an overview of the field of law and psychology. Hi, I'm delighted to be here to provide you with a quick overview of the field of psychology and law. Um, I had the uh, distinct uh, pleasure of serving as the past president of the American Psychology Law Society. So in that capacity, I was able to get a nice overview of what people in our field do. Those who are doing applied work at the intersection of psychology and law are both masters and doctoral level professionals who use their psychological methods, knowledge, and training to inform issues that are relevant to the legal system. Psychologists working in this space might provide evidence that could inform legal decisions, often decisions made by others like judges and juries and parole boards, or evidence that could be used to improve policies and procedures used by the legal system. Training programs for work in psychology and law are specific to the types of applications one will be doing in your career, and they tend to fall into categories of clinical forensic programs or non-clinical programs that center on psychology and law issues. <clears throat> in clinical forensic programs, uh, you'll be provided broad training in clinical psychology with specific training in psycholegal issues. And <clears throat> both types of programs are available at both the MA and doctoral levels, with doctoral training allowing for more independent work than master level training. Some people also train in a general clinical program and receive more specific forensic training during their internship or uh, at their postdoctoral training program. This type of training allows you to perform psychological evaluations of people. These evaluations are not necessarily the type uh, of clinical evaluations that are typically done, but are designed to evaluate people for mental statuses that are defined in law, but not necessarily in psychology. For example, criminal responsibility and different legal competencies like the competency to stand trial, to prepare a will, or to be executed. Often people who've trained in the, these areas go on to work um, either in courts or in private practice um, where they are hired to evaluate these types of um, these competencies and other type of mental status that is related to the legal system. So they might evaluate whether someone's criminally responsible, again, competent for all sorts of different legal um, decision-making or to evaluate psychological injury or harm. Um, some of these psychologists also work in prisons, consulting on conditions in the prisons and how they might affect the health and well-being of the people uh, who are housed there. Training for other types of applied legal psychology occurs in non-clinical programs. 
uh, there are doctoral programs that specifically train students in psychology and law and may include faculty from developmental, cognitive, community, or social psychology backgrounds, all of whom do research at the intersection of psychology and law. Or you might find a master's or doctoral level program that does not have a specific legal focus, but has a faculty member who conducts research at the intersection of psychology and law. For example, my doctorate is in social psychology, but one of my advisors did research on legal psychology. People who get trained in these areas may work in consulting firms where they consult with attorneys about strategies for jury selection, presentation of trial evidence, and other litigation strategies. They might work in government or other nonprofit agencies doing research on how to improve the functioning of the courts, police, child interviewers, and other groups that make up or interface with the legal system. And for both types of um, training, uh, you might become a faculty member um, working at a university or a college doing research that informs uh, the legal system and the types of decisions that they make and often serve as expert witnesses on all sorts of topics. For example, I do a lot of expert testimony on eyewitness identification, reliability, and the factors that make them less reliable. And that's a basic overview of the types of work that people do at the intersection of psychology and law. Thank you, Margaret that overview of careers in psychology and law. Hopefully this has piqued your interest to hear from other psychologists who work in careers in law and psychology, and our panelists are prepared to do just that. Our next panelist is Jamor Maddox, who will speak on his role in forensic evaluation of harm, risk, and abilities in family, civil, sentencing, and police cases. Hi everyone, I'm Jamor Maddox. I'm a licensed psychologist with a board certification in forensic psychology. And I'm happy to be here with you today to share some thoughts um, with you high school students and undergraduates about my job in forensic psychology. Um, first off, let me describe my typical workday and it generally comes in about three or four different varieties. So typical workday number one involves me spending anywhere from three hours to about eight hours in a room with another person interviewing them, asking them a bunch of questions and giving them a bunch of different tests. And that person could be a child or it could be an adult. And we generally call this a psychological evaluation. And the questions I'm asking is to gain an understanding in order to provide an opinion to address some type of question. And that question is really important to different uh, courts, uh, judges and juries in our legal system. Uh, the question could be about whether this person has been harmed, uh, psychologically speaking, by some agency or by another individual. Or the question could be about if uh, a particular candidate to be a police officer has the psychological qualities to do that job suitably. Um, the question that I might be addressing is whether or not someone's um, life experiences uh, as they relate to that person's mental health could have impacted something that person did that was wrong, that was illegal and resulted in them being sentenced and having to uh, face a prison uh, sentence. Uh, that question may also involve what's that, what, what is that person's risk to the public if they weren't to be uh, sent to prison and if they were to be released. So these are the types of questions that psychologists who specialized in forensic psychology have the privilege to answer these big deal issues for families and for our communities about whether or not a parent is suitable to care for his or her child um, following some type of abuse that happened. It's, it's psychologists that provide the courts with opinions about these issues. And uh, if you think the idea of doing therapy is interesting, like I did, then these ideas, uh, if you're like me, are bound to fascinate you as well to really weigh in on these uh, heavy decisions before um, judges and, and juries. Typical workday number two, when I'm not interviewing, I'm writing. I'm getting all of that information together, the test results, the what we call collateral information I may have collected from a family member that knows how risky this parent is or how harmed this child is. And I'm gathering all of that information, I'm putting it together in a way that makes sense to someone who's not a psychologist. So it can't be very technical, just the way I'm trying to like avoid speaking in a technical way to you undergraduates and high school students today. It's our goal to be able to speak about the science of psychology in ways 
that's easy for our grandparents to understand who may not know anything about psychology. Um, that's what that's supposed to be one of one of our strengths if you're practicing as a forensic psychologist and it is easier said than done. So typical workday number two, I'm a writer. I'm putting together reports. And typical workday number three, although it's not so typical because it doesn't happen a lot, is going into court to share that expertise that we have about the science, to represent the science of psychology and uh, the process you use to gather all that information and sharing it with the people who are in court. We call this testimony. And sometimes it's done in court, sometimes it's done in something called a deposition, which basically just looks like a big conference type of a situation. And all eyes will be on you. And the first set of questions you get will be from the person who uh, generally uh, hired you. And those questions uh, you'll be well um, prepared to answer. And then the next set of questions you get will be from someone on the other side of the case who uh, has the goal of um, making sure that you don't look as smart as you may think you look initially. This is called cross-examination. And many of you are probably familiar with seeing this on TV. Uh, my route in terms of how I became a forensic psychologist, it wasn't typical. I didn't aspire to be a forensic psychologist when I grew up. I wanted to be a, an architect and I wanted to be a doctor, but then I did organic chemistry and then I fell back on my major, which was psychology and I still wanted to be a doctor. And then I worked in correctional settings because that's where people of color were. And I really wanted to counsel them. And then I was involved with the legal system kind of sort of there and then found my way to forensic psychology. Uh, so that's my roundabout route of getting here. Nowadays, though, you have shows like CSI and all of these types of crime scene shows where the court's involved and mental health and behavioral experts are involved. And so maybe some of you want to grow up and be forensic psychologists. But I'm the type of forensic psychologist that provides expert testimony, not the type that's helping you know, law enforcement capture uh, the offender necessarily. Top three things I love about my job, the flexibility. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. Becoming a doctor of psychology is a low risk way of opening up a successful business. Um, so uh, I like that part that I get to work for myself and set my own hours. In terms of the specialties in psychology, forensic psychology has a reputation of being one of the better paid specialties. And I also enjoy uh, communicating with people who aren't psychologists all day and discussing the complexities of therapy. Although as I get older, I'm starting to enjoy therapy more and more um, uh, surprisingly. So uh, one of those uh, COVID pandemic effects, I suppose, just doing more of that work uh, in the face of uh, this health crisis challenge that our nation has faced. And of course, if you're a forensic psychologist, you're a licensed psychologist first. So if you ever wanna do that type of work and swing back over to the clinical side, well, you'll be licensed to do it. So um, that's my take on my career, how I got here, what I do, and I'll give it back to Betsy. Thank you, Jamar. Next up is Natalie, who will be speaking about her faculty role as a clinical forensic psychologist in a public psychiatric hospital. I'm Natalie Anumba. I am an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School, where I wear a few different hats mostly related to clinical practice and the education of forensic mental health professionals. One of my major roles is as a clinically trained forensic psychologist at a state psychiatric hospital. In this role, I conduct evaluations of persons who are facing criminal charges in a process similar to how Dr. Maddox described. Uh, essentially, at times, as criminal cases proceed in court, questions come up that are related to the defendant's mental health, and judges and lawyers find it beneficial to have a mental health professional provide information to help them make decisions. In my state, which is Massachusetts, the judge will often send a person facing criminal charges to a state psychiatric hospital for an evaluation. I'm a psychologist who does such evaluations. I do many different types of evaluations, including competence to stand trial. So basically looking at a person's understanding of court proceedings and their ability to assist their attorney in their case. Uh, I also assess criminal responsibility. So looking at the person's mental state at the time of an alleged offense in consideration of a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, I also uh, do assessments of mental health considerations to aid the court in determining a sentence, and I also do assessments of individuals' risk of violence. I write reports of my observations, diagnoses, and clinical opinions, which go to the judge, 
and when needed, I testify in court as an expert witness all over Massachusetts. As faculty in a medical school, I am also involved in education. Uh, I'm faculty in a postdoctoral fellowship in forensic psychology, so I supervise trainees who have gotten their PhDs in psychology, but are getting advanced postdoctoral training in forensic psychology. That involves helping uh, these trainees refine their considerable skills at interviewing, writing reports, and testifying. I also lead didactic trainings, so sitting in a small classroom group with these developing professionals and discussing forensic psychology topics and how to translate them to on the ground practice. I also function as co-director of the law and psychiatry program within the Department of Psychiatry at UMass Medical School. This is an interdisciplinary collaboration that is dedicated to research, consultation, education, and clinical services within the interaction of mental health sciences and the law. So I liaise with the leadership of the training programs we have in forensic psychology and psychiatry within the department, and I also oversee training and education activities for mental health professionals throughout Massachusetts who work in the public sector. I like being involved in my field, so I also try to be an active member of the American Psychological Association and its divisions and to connect with others, be they colleagues or students or interested people. Um, to briefly describe my training, I became interested in a career in psychology in high school. When I went to college, I took psych classes and I realized I really liked psychology and law and forensic psychology. So I did a lot of research, helped with research at my university, volunteered and did internships that exposed me to various aspects of mental health and the law and helped me figure out what I liked and didn't like. Um, so I trained, I went to graduate school to get a PhD in clinical psychology with a forensic concentration. And then after I graduated, I completed extra training in forensic psychology uh, to provide me with the foundations for my work today. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Next, Jason Cantone will describe his role in judicial processes, legal decision-making, and judicial education. Well, thank you for having me. So when I started college, I didn't know much about psychology and law other than what I saw in the movies like Sounds of the Lambs. But then I took a psychology course and really developed an interest in not only understanding how the brain worked, but also how psychology applied to the law. And since then, I focused on that application. You know, how do we take the skills we learn in school and apply them to improve the world around us? I completed a dual degree graduate program in psychology and law. I completed law school and my master's degree in 2008. And then I completed my PhD in 2011 while working full time. That full time job was with the United States Air Force at US Strategic Command. Through that, I had the great honor to work alongside some brilliant men and women in the negotiation process for a nuclear weapons treaty. And when we think about nuclear weapons, we don't always think about psychology and law, but both play a really pivotal role. You know, nuclear weapons are often seen as a psychological deterrent, and they certainly evoke psychological emotions such as fear. Working on a treaty? Well, psychology is a part of conflict resolution and negotiation. You know, how do you get people to work together for a common cause? that's psychology. And then the treaty itself, well, it needs to be based on international law. That's the law. You know, this job allowed me to apply those psychology and law skills to reduce the number of nuclear weapons we have in the world and to also make the ones we have existing already more secure. Now that was a really exciting time, but about 11 years ago, I moved to my current position at the Federal Judicial Center or the FJC. Now, the FJC is an independent agency of the US courts, and it has three major missions. I work in the research division. We do research for the entire federal court system on issues such as how to improve the administration of justice. How do we make courts more efficient? I've also worked on projects related to reducing bias, enhancing cooperation between courts, and ensuring that people who bring cases to the courts feel that the process was procedurally fair. And we also partner with the National Academies on a reference manual to help judges better understand scientific evidence and the issues that might come before their court. You know, this includes forensic identification and mental health assessment topics 
that you'll often see discussed in psychology and law programs. And again, each of those research projects were strengthened by my knowledge in psychology and law. You know, we also are the educational branch for the federal courts. Now, when federal judges are confirmed to the Senate, they come to us to learn about how to be a judge and also for substantive education throughout their careers. You know, we offer a variety of courses. Psychology of judging is one of them. You know, I've also had the great privilege to work on our third mission, which is international. We work with Supreme Courts and judicial education academies around the world to partner in how do we improve courts internationally. I've traveled to work in the Republic of Uzbekistan, and of late, I've led virtual programs with judges and educators in India and Colombia. You know, just as with my last job with the Air Force, I really appreciate the opportunity to share psychological insight internationally and to also learn a lot of new things. You know, I've also had the opportunity to serve as a volunteer for many organizations I teach, and then I also continue applying research that interests me. You know, some of my more recent research, it focuses how on in court settings or in the workplace, how can we better understand and prevent religious discrimination or discrimination against individuals with accents? You know, my career focuses on on taking those skills we learn from psychology and applying them to better understand and improve the legal system. You know, I find it fascinating And I hope you found it fascinating as well. Thank you, Jason. Next, we'll hear from April about her faculty role as a clinical forensic psychologist working in juvenile justice. Again, thanks for having me here. I want to tell a little bit about my career trajectory and where I am now in my career in psychology and law. A lot of students, they come to me and they say, oh, I've known since fourth grade I wanted to be a forensic psychologist, or they had an AP psych class where they learned all about that. I wasn't that student. Um, I actually went to uh, undergrad as an animal and poultry science major. My whole life, I wanted to be a veterinarian. But one of the parts of my life that was really important to me was volunteerism. And so while I was in my second year of undergrad, I actually was volunteering at a women's shelter in Virginia. During that time, I knew little about intimate partner violence or sexual assault. But during that semester there, I learned a lot, a lot of things that I didn't have exposure to in my upbringing. By the end of that internship year, I said, I want to change my major. I want to change my life. I'm going to work with survivors of violence for the rest of my life. And so I did just that. I changed my major, uh, went on to a master's degree program. And while I continued to work at that shelter and while I was enrolled in that master's degree program, found this field of forensic psychology. And for me, when working with survivors, I often wondered what happens next for them? What happens to them when they enter the criminal justice system if they choose to to, uh, seek justice for uh, how they've been offended against? I went on to get my PsyD from the Florida Institute of Technology in Melbourne, Florida. I chose that program because they had a specialty in forensic psych, as well as a child and family specialty. During my first year, I took an ethics course. And in that course, we had to write an essay about populations we think we couldn't work with. I wrote this long essay about how I could never, ever, ever work with individuals who sexually offend. But in our training, we do a lot of work in practice. So I was working with children who are in residential treatment, children who are trauma survivors. And along the way, I saw that a few of those children begin to sexually act out or even offend. Started putting the pieces together. So I actually took a leap during my training and started working with individuals who sexually offend. And I actually enjoyed doing that work. Whether I'm working with survivors of violence or individuals who inflict violence, I'm dedicated to public safety. And so after I completed my degree and completed my postdoctoral fellowship in forensic psychology, my first job was at Auburn University. Actually, it wasn't at the university. We had a a contract with the Department of Youth Services to work at a inpatient program, residential treatment program for adolescents who sexually offend. Who do you think these kids are? What do they look like to you when you think about that image? Well, when I walked into that facility, I learned very quickly they're just children. Worked there for three years supervising students who were doing their assessments and evaluations. And throughout that time, I started collecting stories. 
a lot of the work that my colleagues just talked about in doing forensic assessment is learning the stories of others and often sharing those stories. What I learned kind of frightened me. One, a lot of these kids who engage in sexual offenses never offended again. In fact, our recidivism rate, the rate at which these kids would reoffend, was only 4%. Only 4% of kids who completed our program would reoffend. But a lot of our kids went on the sex offense registry, which meant their, dis their lives were disrupted, couldn't get jobs in the future, may not be able to go to college, maybe have to move their families. And that was really hard on me. Second, as a black woman, I would go into that facility each and every day and it was majority black and brown kids. Then I would get home at night and the Black Lives Matter movement was happening. So at that point in my early career, I had to think about what I wanted to do in order to change our system. Could we prevent some of these kids from entering the juvenile justice system to begin with? How can I aid in thinking about how we disrupt that disproportionate minority contact of individuals of color entering the system? So now in my current position at the University of Denver, I teach in our master's in forensic psychology program, preparing the next generation of clinicians to solve these problems. But I also wanna dedicate my life in, uh, in the areas of social justice and prevention. One, wanting to think about how we don't have those kids enter the system in the first place. So the stories I heard, many of our kids didn't have comprehensive sex ed, so they didn't know a lot about right from wrong in terms of consent. Uh, so my 2018 TED Talk talked just about that. How can we provide kids with consent education so they would make better decisions? I also got a grant in 2020 to think about providing treatment to adolescents who had experienced violence and are now in the juvenile justice system. 90% of girls who are in our juvenile justice system have faced abuse. What if we got them treatment for all that trauma they experienced? maybe the actions that they're engaging in are a reflection of them acting out from violence that was inflicted on them. And so for me in my current career, I'm focused on that policy change. Can I talk to stakeholders about the stories that these youth told me? Can I talk to policymakers about contributing more funding to prevention efforts so we don't have a system? I often say to students, I hope I don't have a job one day because that would mean that some of the inequities in our system would be fixed that would mean that our kids are protected. And that's what I hope to do in this field. So thank you for having me. Thank you, April. Next, Jason Lawrence will speak on his role as a forensic examiner in the Center for Behavioral Medicine. Hi everyone, I'm Jason. Um, so I'd like to start my bit with just kind of how I got into psychology, how uh, you could say. Um, I do, initially got interested in high school, um, if you could call it that. Uh, we had one class, it was taught by the swim coach. Uh, we watched a lot of YouTube videos, um, but it was some interesting stuff, I thought, you know, um, no idea what I would do with that, no idea what it really meant practically, but um, it was cool. Um, so thankfully I had the opportunity to go to college. Um, I knew that was something I wanted to do for myself, but I still was pretty lost at the time. Uh, they start asking you pretty early, like, what do you want to major in? What do you want to major in? I had other friends being like, oh, I came here because I'm going to go to med school or I'm going into engineering. And I said, um, uh, I'd like to learn Japanese. He's not coming, did you? Um, so that's what I started doing at first. Um, and then I wanted to take some other classes. So I started taking psychology classes again. So I remember that one class in high school, you know. Um, and as I continued taking them, uh, it was my junior year. Um, I took one class called Psychology and the Law. And I remember taking that class and going, this is a job? I can, I can do this? This is cool. Um, and so I proceed to go talk to the professors. I go, so, you know, what else do you do? Like, what does that happen over here? Just, I just, I wanted to know more. Um, and listening to them, I realized, you know, if I'm going to want to look for a career in this, I need to get a doctorate. Uh, which is not something that had been on my radar up until that point. Um, but I realized this is what I, I think I want to really want to do this. I want to seek it out. And so I, I scrambled. I went out um, to try to get some practicum experience with people. I found some uh, practitioners in the field who I just emailed and said, could I just sort of be around while you do your job, please? Um, and they were all so open and so happy to have me there. Uh, it was one of the best experiences just that 
Uh, and thankfully, I was able to get uh, into a doctorate program. I, I got my PhD from Sam Houston State University. Um, and even in graduate school, I knew I loved, really liked this field, but I was still figuring out, you know, what exactly I want to do with it and how that's going to look and how this is going to work. And I still had other uh, classmates who were already talking about what internship they want to do after they get their doctorate. And I was like, you have to do internships after you get the doctorate? I thought, aren't we done yet? Um, <laughs> so I, I say all this, you know, just, just to mean that like, you know, whoever's listening to this, like, you know, we really need you in this field. And it doesn't have to be something where at the beginning you're like, yup, this is my passion. This is what I want to do. Um, I love my job now. Um, I do a lot of similar things to what you've already heard. I work in a state hospital uh, where we receive orders from the court to evaluate people in their courts. Um, the reasonings can be varied. Some, sometimes it is competency to stand trial. So like, as I said, there's, um, they're concerned that they might be too sick, essentially, mentally, to be put on trial because you shouldn't put someone on trial if they're having mental health issues. That just wouldn't be fair to them. Um, there's also the insanity defense. Um, so essentially evaluating how, what their mental state was at the time of you know, the things they allegedly did. Um, there's also risk evaluations. So there's uh, some states have sexually violent predator statutes. And so sometimes it's my job to evaluate for that if someone is um, a high risk of reoffending sexually in the future and if the courts need to essentially do something about that. Um, one of the best things I do love about my job though is the, the flexibility um, and the, the sheer variety of what I get to do um, because I'm also able to do some private practice work on the side um, where I will do, I won't go into too much detail, but a juvenile certification evaluation. So working, uh, sometimes courts are wondering if a a, an adolescent usually should be tried as an adult or tried in the juvenile system, and I will play a role in that. Um, sometimes we serve just general mitigation. Sometimes lawyers just want that will call me and want to know, hey, is there anything mental health going on with this guy? You know that the court should know about before they sentence him. Um, and I really love being able to work at this like crazy cross section of professionals. You know. Um, Half the time, the lawyers have to really explain to me exactly what they want, how they want, what it means. And I have to explain to them what I can do, what this mental health stuff means. And they're like, so you could say this? And I have to say, no, I can't say that, but I can say this. It's, it sounds vague because it is. <laughs> it's sort of this crazy, um, just mix of all these different professionals all working to do our best to hopefully make this system work as best as we can. Um, to do the justice system as a whole, we all know there's a lot of problems with it. And the idea that I'm playing this role and hopefully trying to make it work as best as possible, and if anything, slowly work to improve it um, by doing sometimes my own research on the side, which again, I have the flexibility to do because I spent all that time going to school and, and getting this degree and this license. Um, I really think it has worked out uh, amazing well for me. Um, I love the work. And honestly, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. Now, Dennis will explain his role in trial strategy and jury consulting services in high stakes litigation. Thanks. Yes, I'm Dennis Stoley, and I'll tell you a little bit about the story of my journey through applied psychology. Um, like some of the other panelists who you've heard from, I took my first psychology class when I was in high school, and it was the favorite class that I ever had, and I decided that I would go to college and major in psychology. And I was first generation college, and so I, I left a large public high school and went to the university and quickly discovered that college was a lot more difficult than high school was. Um, but I stayed interested in psychology, and I also had a lot of other interests, though. I was interested in politics and legislation and policy. And after the end of my first semester, 
I learned about a professor at my university who had a lab where he was studying jury decision making. And I thought, well, that sounds really cool. And so I went and I met with him and I told him that I wanted to be a psychologist. And so he pulled up my transcript, looked at my grades and said, well, I hate to tell you, but you're not getting into a PhD program on the track that you're going right now. So I said, what? You know, and, and I had never heard of such a thing. What is difficult to get into graduate school? So once I came to that realization, I buckled down and started really studying and working hard and bought, brought my B's and C's up to A's. And pretty soon that professor invited me to start coming to his lab and to hang out with his grad students. And by that point, I was absolutely hooked. And I decided that I wanted to get a PhD and that I wanted to get a law degree. And I wanted to spend my life studying psychology and law. And so I worked like crazy, just learning research methods and trying to soak up everything that I possibly could. And I was lucky enough to get into a joint degree program at the University of Nebraska, where I started working with uh, Dr. Stephen Penrod, who is an important researcher in the field. And at Nebraska, I studied lots of areas of law and psychology from jury decision making to therapeutic jurisprudence to the psychology of contracts, all kinds of things. Um, and all of it was fascinating to me. When I finished, I got my law degree and my PhD in social psychology. I left uh, the university and I went into private practice to practice law with a very large law firm. Um, initially, I thought I would do that temporarily to get that important experience. Um, but once I was there, I enjoyed it and I became a partner and I was able to start my own jury consulting business as a subsidiary of the law firm. And I ended up running that consulting practice for 23 years. And I worked mostly on civil jury trials and mostly on behalf of the defense. And I did jury research and jury trials all over the country. So I was traveling all the time, doing focus groups and mock trials and large sample surveys, all the things that you learn how to do as an undergraduate and graduate student in a good psychology program. And I was also picking juries all across the country and was lucky enough to work on some of the biggest, highest profile litigation of the last two decades. Uh, for example, just before I left my consulting practice, I was picking the juries in the opioid litigation, which is currently going on throughout the entire country. And then at the beginning of 22, 2022, I decided to leave my consulting practice and I joined the American Psychological Association as the senior director of the Office of Applied Psychology. And I made that move because I decided that I had accomplished what I wanted to do in my career and I wanted to give back to the profession of psychology, which had done so much for me personally. And so I want to do that by serving the profession through APA. And so now I spend every day promoting the science of applied psychology and trying to help develop a path forward for the science and everybody who's interested in it. And so that's an overview of my journey. And I'll end my comments with that and turn it back to Dr. Schoenfeld. Thank you, Dennis. Now I'm gonna ask our panelists for one final comment. Perhaps what they wish they knew before they entered graduate school or some other helpful insight. Margaret? Uh, I just wanna say that this is a field in which you can make a real difference. Um, I have a sister who's a clinical PhD and has a private practice and actually has just started doing some forensic psychology herself, to, surprising me after 25 years, she's now <laughs> dipping her toes in. But we used, I used to joke with her because she's like, I just want to help people. And I said, I want to help people too. I just don't want to do it one at a time. I want to help. I want to change the world. I want to change systems. And the beauty of this particular area is if you see injustices in the legal system, this is a field that will help you participate in writing those injustices. And I highly encourage your participation in doing so. Thank you. Jamor? I think uh, I'll leave folks with something that I was happy to learn upon starting my undergraduate career in graduate school, which is that you're working and it's not all classroom stuff. I think 
what I hear most commonly from folks in terms of obstacles, why they don't want to pursue a career in forensic psychology is the amount of schooling that's involved. They're like, what, four years after high school, then five plus years more? It just, it sounds really overwhelming, but you should know that as an undergraduate, many undergraduates don't have Friday classes. You're kind of just doing your thing, especially if you're not a student athlete. And um, you should know that in graduate school, after your first year or so, while there still will be classroom work involved, a lot of your time, you're actually uh, spending counseling folks, especially if you go to what's called a PsyD program and pursue a doctor of psychology, as opposed to a doctor of philosophy. So it's, it's, uh, it's not all classroom all the time. It's a lot different from your current experience now in high school. And you should also know you can reach out to folks like me. You see my name up there, Google me, contact me, and I'm happy to assist. Thank you. Thank you. Natalie? So, yeah, I would say this is a really big field. Um, it's very easy to get overwhelmed with all the different roles and opportunities in it. So I would also recommend that you talk to people who are doing all kinds of different things, ask questions, find out what their jobs and their daily activities are like. And as you progress through school, you'll have more and more opportunities to pave your path and to spend the time doing the things that you want to do. Um, I would also encourage people to read things. So APA's website has a lot of useful resources and tools, you know, um, for students. If you're interested in psychology and law, check out Division 41 of APA, the American Psychology Law Society, which has websites and resources that are specifically for students who are sort of faced with the big field and trying to figure out what they want to do in it. Thank you. Jason Cantone. Thank you. I, I want to echo what Natalie just said, that you really need to reach out. You know, find people. There are a lot of great people that want to help you. And also, a lot of people nowadays seem to act like the pandemic is the first time students have faced significant amounts of stress. Well, no, there's always been stress, and it's important to take time for your mental health. There's going to be so much to do in this field. Psychology and law is a field that is going to be around for a long time, and it needs your brilliant minds to help fix what's going on. But you won't be at your best if you don't prioritize yourself and your health while you're exploring these important areas. Thank you. April? Similar to what my colleague said, we need you. Um, I know a lot of students and young folks are getting activated by various social justice movements and psychology and law or forensic psychology is the area where you can create a lot of change. Um, so that's first. Uh, second, kind of echoing off of what Natalie said, I often tell students to find mentors. A lot of the books tell you say, uh, say find a mentor, but I say find multiple. There are a lot of people out here who are willing to help you. There are a lot of people who are out here willing to kind of guide you and navigate your career path. As Dennis uh, said earlier, and I connect with this, and I know a few other people on this call connect with it, I'm a first generation college student. So I bumbled around for a little while. And after a while, I found the people who were invested in my development, invested in my career path, and I'm forever indebted to them. And I want to carry that forward. Uh, so find those great mentors out there. Thank you. Jason Lawrence. Um, I think if there's any one thing I'd want to say, it's just that it's, it, it is a lot certainly to get into to this field. I mean, doctorates are nothing to, you know, to take lightly, but it's also not a race. Um, I think in the high school, undergrad level, and even early graduate levels, people can get this idea of like, I got to go, go, go. If I'm not doing this now, I'm going to something, something. And then there's other people who, for a variety of reasons, might not have that opportunity right now. You know, it could be a practical thing, a financial thing, anything. Um, and they'll think, well, I can't get into this because I'll have to take, who knows, years between school even to even make it up to there. That's all all right. You know, like taking care of yourself and what you got to do, you know, maybe you want to go work to make sure you can financially, you know, deal with school first. Um, maybe you just have other interests you want to explore first. Uh, and just as an example of that, the graduate school that accepted me during my interviews the director of clinical training at that graduate school during when we were talking, we talked the whole time about the Japanese drumming group that I was a part of in college. <laughs> like that's what she wanted to hear about. Things like that are still important. You know, you're not wasting your time by following your interests and by keeping yourself happy. So take your time if you need to. It's okay. Thank you. 
Dennis? Yeah, my advice would be to not overlook the fundamentals. And what I mean by that is you have to be a really good writer. You have to learn how to write. You have to be good at basic statistics. So you have to learn math. There are just some basic things that you have to learn. And they're not necessarily the things that are going to inspire you. You might be inspired by a a particular area of social justice or this or that, it's probably unlikely that you're going to be inspired by where to put the comma, but you've got to learn that. And I've seen too many people who let that become an impediment to an otherwise brilliant career. And if you master those things, they will serve you for the rest of your career, no matter what direction you go. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you all for these very important insights. In closing, many thanks to our panelists for sharing their careers in law and psychology. What an exciting array of careers. I hope you have enjoyed today's presentation as much as I have. If you would like to learn more about career in, a career in psychology and law, contact us. Visit the APA Office of Applied Psychology, APA Division 41, or the American Psychology Law Society. The Division 41 website has information on publications, meetings, and awards. The American Psychology Law Society has information on graduate school, internships, and jobs. It has a very fun and welcoming student section where you can reach out to psychologists such as the ones that as you've seen on the panel today and an opportunity to engage with them. The APA Office of Applied Psychology has links to other video panels on other <laughs> careers in applied psychology. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye and good luck pursuing your career in applied psychology.